Hello, good evening. This is the All24 News. I'm Ibrahim Kashur and to the headlines. French presidency voters using Harkis Act as a key role in the campaign. Protesters are still moving forward and security forces in Sudan close the main roads leading to the capital. After a Russian mediation, Armenia and Azerbaijan stopped the armed clash that lasted for almost one year. Hello again. First in our top stories, the French is willing to discuss an apology act for Harkis, which Algerian population and government will not tolerate. The act taken by French government is tool for more voters in the next election that French President Emmanuel Macron is helpful to win. Usama Yadir reports. French and Algerian relations are heading to a more complicated phase, at a time when France is expected to take a step forward to reconstruct the Franco-Algerian relations and give a clear apology for the war crimes it committed against the Algerian population. The latter became more engaged in provoking the Algerian government and population. French Parliament is preparing for discussing an apology act, which streams in the benefit of Harkis, who are Algerians who served the French colonialism during French occupation on Algerian territories, which Algeria considers traitors. This act is another provoking point for Algerian population, as the French President Emmanuel Macron was criticized by former President Nicolas Sarkozy recently for his last statements against the Algerian history and population. Politics experts believe the last act of the French government is to complicate matters in the Franco-Algerian relations and that Macron is seeking supporters and voters in this category of citizens. According to Algerian politicians, this last act will further complicate the situation and will probably create more tension. France is playing on a horrible colonialism history, which will result with more difficulty in the Franco-Algerian diplomatic relations and it is more likely to be the biggest loser at a time when large economic powers are racing to win the deal with Algeria at the economic level. Security forces in Sudan closed the main roads leading to Khartoum to prevent demonstrators from reaching the heart of the capital and to reduce the number of participants in the contest of a great security alert in the country at a time when international efforts are continuing to find a way out of this crisis. Zahra Fujani reports. A great security alert in the Sudanese capital was launched to prevent the demonstrators from reaching the important headquarters of the country, ahead of the launch of potential million demonstrations raising the slogan of freedom from the military. Demonstrations come within the framework of the escalation carried out by the forces of freedom and change to force the army to change its decisions regarding the dissolution of the government and imposing a state of emergency. Despite the announcement of the Sudanese army chief, Abdel Fattah al-Burhan, about a sovereign council and the swearing-in of its members, the prime minister has not yet been chosen due to international pressure on al-Burhan, according to specialists who hinted at the possibility of the country heading towards complexity due to political tension. Well, the uh, situation is no secret to anyone, although it is a bit sensitive at the moment. The military has uh, organized a coup d'etat, and uh, they have uh, promised before, or let's say in the beginning of the coup d'etat, that uh, the power will go to the public and that uh, the end result will be a democratic country. However, uh, midway through the uh, situation, they decided that uh, they will do what they promised, but in their own special way. Uh, they cut the internet in the country, and uh, they have been also, uh, according to various sources, shooting people in the street and uh, trying to suppress the uh, uprising, the, the uprising uh, voice of the people to uh, stop this madness. International reactions continue towards Sudan's developments led by the United States, which has entered the crisis line. The U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs recently held meetings with Sudanese political officials as well as civil society activists to resolve the Sudanese crisis. 
According to the United Nations, Ethiopia has witnessed a general arrestation in which at least a thousand people, mainly ethnic Tigrayans, have been detained in cities across, across Ethiopia since state of emergency was declared two weeks ago. Islam Seed on what follow. According to the UN, since a state of emergency was announced, more than 1,000 people have been imprisoned in cities across Ethiopia. Most of those detained are majorly ethnic Tigrayans. In the same context, the U.S. chief warned against arrests that could widen divisions and resentments. The state of emergency was announced a year after a conflict broke out between Premier Abiy Ahmed government and forces aligned with the Tigray People's Liberation Front which the political party control in the northern region of Tigray. The six-month proclamation authorizes suspects to be held without charge for the duration of the state of emergency, as well as house-to-house -house searches without a warrant. It has been said that captivity circumstances were generally terrible, with many of those detained being held in jammed police stations and unaware of the basis of their detention. The battle between the Ethiopian government and the TPLF has killed thousands of people, and driven more than 2 million people to leave their homes yesteryear. Thousands of people are currently suffering from famine-like circumstances. It's worth mentioning that Martin Griffiths, the UN's top humanitarian official, has announced the allocation of $40 million to help scale up emergency operations in Ethiopia's conflict-torn north and as an early response to drought in the south. Police department said at least three people have been killed and 33 others were wounded in twin suicide bombings in Uganda's capital Kampala, at least in a series of attacks over the past month. The attacks took place within the three minutes of each other on Tuesday and were carried out by three suicide bombers. One of the explosions was on the street near the parliament building and the other near a police station. The explosion near Parliament appeared to hit closure to building, housing and insurance company and subsequent fire in Flungerland cars parked outside. Regarding Palestinian cars, United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres st stressed that two-state solution is the only way to achieve the aspiration of peoples of the region. Guterres, during a conference on establishing peace in the Middle East being held at United Nations headquarters in New York, called on the Palestinian leaders and the Zionist entity to show the necessary political will to revive, to resume the dialogue between each other. Syria's state-run media says the Zionist entity carried out an attack on the country's south with two missiles targeting an empty house, but no casualties were reported. The state-run news agency Sana said the missiles came from the Zionist entity occupied the Jolan Heights early on today, Wednesday, amid at the building south of the capital Damascus, adding that Syria's defense systems interrupted one of the incoming missiles. Richard Moe's senior military officer said that there is a great risk of an accidental war breaking out between the West and Russia than at any time since the Cold War. A statement came after a first-time escalation of tensions between Moscow and the West due to Russia mobilizing its army on the Ukrainian borders and the migrant crisis of Belarusian European sideline. Let's follow this report. Britain's Chief of Defence Staff, Nick Carter, made a statement that shook the security and the military circles in Britain and Europe when he warned of the possibility of war with Russia. The British general considered that this war is closer than ever before, driven by the events taking place in Eastern Europe, the latest of which was the refugee crisis on the border between Belarus and Poland. In this regard, Britain plans to send 600 Special Forces soldiers to Ukraine due to fears of Russian military move towards its eastern neighbor. With this tense reality, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg responded that the alliance is watching with concern the escalating tensions on the borders of the European Union and Belarus, as well as on the borders of Ukraine. Any further provocation uh, or aggressive actions by Russia would be of serious concern. We call on Russia to be transparent about its military activities. It is important to prevent escalation and reduce tensions. 
On the other hand, Moscow keeps building up its army forces by sending two nuclear-capable strategic bombers to patrol Belarusian airspace, in a move that was said to show its military support for Belarus, and through which it sends a message to the European Union countries. The United States Secretary of State Antony Blinken expressed his country's concerns about the irregular movement of the Russian army. Forces that we see on, uh, on Ukraine's borders, um, I can't speak to um, Russia's intentions. We don't know uh, what they are, uh, but we do know that uh, we've uh, seen in the past. It is worth mentioning that many military analysts reported that Britain leads the European camp in the face of Russia that attempts to expand, which makes it always on alert, in exchange for the United States taking on confronting China. The Russian Defense Ministry revealed that Armenia and Azerbaijan stopped armed clash between them after Russian mediation. This comes after Armenia confirmed on Tuesday that 15 soldiers were killed in clashes on the country's border with Azerbaijan. For its part, the Defense Minister of this latter said in a statement that its soldiers repelled a country attack by the Armenian forces. Zara Furjani on what follow. The Yerevan parliament announced that 15 Armenian soldiers were killed in clashes on the country's borders with Azerbaijan and the Armenian Defense Ministry confirmed that Baku had captured 12 of its soldiers. These developments prompted Armenia to request rapid assistance from Russia for what it considered as defense of its territorial sovereignty against Azerbaijan. The ongoing confrontations near the disputed Nagorno-Karabakh region between Baku and Yerevan came after tensions escalated continuously in the past weeks between the two countries, despite the signing of a ceasefire agreement and the deployment of Russian peacekeepers after the clashes in 2020. Italian and French leaders Mario Draghi and Emmanuel Macron will sign a deal next week to try to tell the balance of power in Europe after the departure of German Chancellor Angela Merkel. The Italian Prime Minister Mario Draghi and French President Emmanuel Macron will sign an agreement next week in an attempt to change the balance of power in Europe after the departure of the German Chancellor Angela Merkel from political life. Italy intends to name the treaty after the Italian President Palace Quirinale, where the treaty will be signed following the model of the 1963 LZ Treaty between France and Germany. Details of the agreement have not yet been disclosed, but it's been reported that it would support bilateral cooperation in areas that boost economic traits, tourism, and culture. It's worth mentioning that the project was first put forward in 2018 under the former Italian Prime Minister Paolo Gentolini, but relations between Rome and Paris deteriorated following the exchange of accusations between Paris and the Interior Minister Matteo Salvini about welcoming migrants and meeting with a group of yellow vests. Cinici Emmanuel Macron. Two UK's economy inflation rates in the United Kingdom reached and presidented race in the last 10 years as household energy bills rocketed while energy, while energy prices are a big driver of this inflation in the country. More details with Ayadi Usama. Cost of living in London is taking steady steps to a 10-year leap, which provoked concerns of economy experts in the country. England Bank forecasted a rate hike next month. And the UK is witnessing the highest top of inflation. Consumer prices index rose by 4.2% in the 12 months to October 2021, up from 3.1% in September, contrasting to what experts expected of 3.9%. Labour conditions have tightened and economic growth moderated in recent period, and this last economic inflation is considered the highest in the last 10 years. The largest upward contribution in inflation rate came from housing and household services with 1.23%, transport rated 1.8%, restaurants and hotels reached 0.43%. The scary inflation in the UK came due to the high demand of gas and oil, which pushed the prices of energy to higher rates, in addition to a shortage of many products as the government ended facilitation and support to business. Besides, most companies are struggling to recruit truck drivers and hospitality staff as an outcome of COVID-19 and Brexit. Francisco Pola, finance and economy writer, showed worry on a tweet 
that even if her country succeeds to reduce inflation rates, the prices are likely to remain the same. Eventually, higher energy bills will do some of the job of interest rate rise by leaving the British with less disposal income. Asia-Pacific countries are sticking tight borders controls ever back, even as vaccination rates top out, dampening prospects for revival of the region's pandemic battle travel industry. Islam Seed reports. Asia-Pacific countries are sticking to constricted border controls despite the high vaccination rates, which may revive travel industry that have been struggling recently. The region's conservative approach contrasts sharply with Europe and North America, where immunized travelers, including tourists, can travel freely with few limitations aside from an important risk of contracting the disease. China and Hong Kong has become more isolated as a result of a severe zero-COVID policy that requires weeks of hotel confinement, while other Asian countries have limited non-essential travels. Despite relaxing restrictions for select visitors such as business travelers and students, Japan and South Korea have yet to announce a timetable for the resumption of tourism. According to reports, international tourists will not return to Australia until next year. Around 70% of the population has had two vaccinations. Singapore has resumed quarantine-free traveling phases with more than 80% of the population. Some countries in the region, particularly those with insufficient vaccine coverage, have taken a more aggressive stance. On the other hand, India has reopened its borders to tourists from more than 90 nations, despite the fact that fewer than one-third of the population is double vaccinated. Thailand reopened to tourists as well from more than 60 nations on November 1st. All in all, Asian countries are still working for curbing the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic. A virtual meeting was held by the leaders of two superpowers, the USA and China. The meeting called for lowering the tension between the two poles and tackle numerous fights. Taiwan issue was the top file that the two leaders discussed. Usama Yadi again. A three-hour virtual meeting was held on Monday between U.S. leader Joe Biden and his counterpart Xi Jinping. This long high-level diplomacy meeting discussed various files. The start was when Biden stated that the responsibility of these two superpowers leaders should remain positive, and it's their responsibility to prevent the relations between the two economic poles from veering to a conflict, whether intended or unintended. Xi started the meeting by calling his American counterpart as his old friend, as both of the presidents seemed determined to decrease tension in the relation between the countries on the most turbulent areas of their relations. As stated by Chinese officials, Taiwan issue was the top file in the talk. This comes after Chinese military deployed increasing numbers of fighter jets near Taiwan, which they consider as part of the territories while U.S. considers the island as self-ruled. Chinese military held exercises near Taiwan region in response to the visit of the American congressional delegation in the island. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesman Xiao Lijiang stated Monday that Taiwan issue concerns China's sovereignty and territorial integrity, adding that it's China's core interest. Despite the domestic challenges, Biden was described to come to the meeting from a position of force, while Xi stressed that China and U.S. should coexist in peace and respect the win-win cooperation between the two countries. No joint statement was released by the two leaders, as they both showed that face-to-face meeting is more preferable for further discussions. A deadly storm has wreaked havoc across the western Canadian province of British Columbia. At least one person were died and two people were missing after torrential rain flooded homes and inundated several highways, cutting off one of Canada's busiest ports from the rest of the country. One person has been confirmed to be dead and the toll of damage and destruction continues to escalate as torrential rains triggered landslides and floods in British Columbia in the northwest of Canada. The bad weather conditions destroyed highways and left tens of thousands of people in Canada and the U.S. without power. Highways across the south of the province were washed away in surging rivers due to mudslides and debris flows. Hundreds of motorists, including children, were trapped on the roads and many were rescued by a helicopter. The total number of people and vehicles unaccounted for has not yet been confirmed. 
the case of uh, a debris, it may be as simple as moving the debris and ensuring that the road that the road is safe. Uh, it may be in other areas that uh, you know uh, there needs to be uh, additional work done. Uh, but the bottom line is this: those technical assessments are being done, uh, and the Ministry of Transportation and Highways are working as hard as they can to get roads open as quickly and as safely as possible. The port of Vancouver, the largest in Canada, announced that all rail access had been cut by floods and landslides further to the east. A city like Merit in the northwest of Vancouver ordered its citizens to be evacuated after rising waters cut off bridges and forced the wastewater treatment plant to stop. Wildfires damaged before less than six months an entire town in British Columbia as temperatures soared during a record-breaking heat dome, raising new worries about climate change. To India, the capital New Delhi faces major air pollution. Officials are calling for citywide lockdown. Schools and colleges have already been shut down. More to be clarified in this report. People are struggling to breathe. A sky obscured by grey smog. High-rise buildings lost their picks in a thick layer of haze. This is the situation in the Indian capital, New Delhi, a city that is sinking in air pollution. The Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology of India said air quality in New Delhi could be described as very poor. This is all because of toxic smog across much of northern India. This condition repeats itself every winter as industrial and vehicular emissions mix with smoke from crop burning after the harvest. Farmers are, however, not to blame. Crop burning amounts to only about 10% of emissions. The Indian government took action and the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi announced during his intervention in COP26 that five key points would be tackled. Stopping the addition of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere by 2070 was one of them. Friends, during this global brainstorming on climate change, I would like to put before you, on behalf of India, five key points to five this challenge. It is a gift to five elixirs. Firstly, India will increase its non-fossil energy capacity to 500 gigawatts by 2030. Secondly, India will fulfill 50% of its energy requirement from renewable resources by 2030. Thirdly, between now and 2030, India will reduce its total projected carbon emission by 1 billion tons. Fourthly, by 2030, India will reduce the carbon intensity of its economy by 45%. And fifthly, by 2070, India will achieve the target of net zero emissions. These five elixirs will have an unprecedented contribution by India towards climate actions. After nearly 20 months of lockdown because of COVID-19, schools and colleges in New Delhi are again shut down. Kids are protected, therefore, from breathing bad air. A step that doesn't seem to be the only one to improve air quality, as clouds of smog engulfed one of the most crowded cities in the world. India's Supreme Court is now calling for a total lockdown in the capital. Justices ordered authorities to halt all non-essential travel on roads in the national capital region. They also told them to close offices in the area, shifting tens of millions of people to work from home. Place under the theme strategic communication and major risk, the challenges, and best the conference, the Higher School of Journalism hosted the conference that saw the participation of 27 experts representing different ministerial departments, specialized bodies, teachers, and researchers from national universities. Melissa Noor reports. The recommendations resulting from the five workshops organized within the framework of this conference at the Higher School of Journalism of Algiers plead for the evaluation and updating of disaster and major risk management plans, including fires and floods that recently struck several provinces of the country. 
Discussions have arose in many spaces about the third millennium challenges, and the issue of major dangers is among the most important one. Statistics show that millions of people around the world have been affected by these major risks, and Algeria is among the regions the most vulnerable to catastrophes, and the actual context of weather instability urges us to focus on the role of the different society actors, consider partners in the making of purposeful and strategic communicational and mediatic messages. The participants pointed to the absence of a risk culture, emphasized the need for a resilient society, and pleaded for the intensification of training and evolving of the civil society in measures to be taken in the face of disasters and major risks as well as the development of regulatory texts for the management reserves and the definition for the missions entrusted to the Joint Disaster Management Commissions, and invited the media to take on the role of raising awareness about these risks. To sport now, the Algerian national football team qualified for the final round of the African qualifiers for the World Cup in Qatar, after a two-old row with Burkina Faso during the match that brought them together in the last sixth round of the Group A competitions, more in this report. And finally, the Algerian team, unbeaten for 33 games in a row, reached the playoffs of the World Cup 2022 in Qatar, and now only two games left to be qualified. The Algerian team advanced a goal scored by Riyad Mahrez in the 21st minute. Burkina Faso equalized through Zakaria Sanogo in the 37th minute. Then Sofiane Farouli scored the second goal for the Algerian team in the 68th minute. But Isofo Dayou scored the second goal for Burkina Faso in the 83rd minute from a penalty kick. The Algerian team raised its score to 14 points at the top of the standings. And Burkina Faso raised its score to 12 points in second place. And just after this battle, the President of the Republic, Mr. Abdelmajid Tabun, extended his congratulations to the Algerian national football team following its qualification for the decisive round, tweeting, to the World Cup champions, God willing, there isn't much left. And just after the game within the press conference, the Algerian national team coach Jamal Belmadi stated that his team deserves to be qualified for the final round of the 2022 World Cup in Qatar. I was waiting for a very difficult match similar to facing Côte d'Ivoire in the quarterfinals of the 2019 African Cup of Nations. Burkina Faso is one of the big teams in Africa, although it did not manage to reach the World Cup. And I see that this coach and this team, they will have a world in the next finals of the African Cup of Nations. The most important thing is to qualify for the playoffs, and I think we deserve that, given the results we achieved and the many goals we scored. I assure you today, the match against Burkina Faso will give the players more experience in the preparation for what is to come. Ce pays, euh, grand pays du football quand même, n'a jamais eu la chance de, 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 jouer une qualifi de, de jouer une Coupe du Monde, une phase finale. Belmadi admitted that his players were dominated by confusion and fear of receiving goals. Likewise, the Portuguese scenario. The situation euh, un peu, un peu inhabituelle. C'est ça qui me fait dire que... The work is not over yet and we will consider some things. When you want to qualify for the World Cup, not by defeating Djibouti and weak teams but by meeting big competitors and strong teams. We are the African champions and we will defend our continental title with full force in the upcoming African Cup of Nations. Indeed, our national team is worthy of this victory. Yet, another win is still a need. And one game left, divided into two parts, one out, another one in. With God willing, we will make it through to the World Cup Finals. And to this end, ladies and gentlemen, let's have a reminder for our main top stories. French presidency voters using Harkis Act as a key role in their campaigns. Protesters are still moving forward and security forces in Sudan close the main roads leading to the capital. After a Russian mediation, Armenia and Azerbaijan stopped the armed clash that lasts for one year almost. 
That's all for now. Thank you so much for being with us. Take care of yourself. Good night.